Cupertino, I was playing soccer. Uh, very early on, had a love for music and a love for, and a curiosity about how things work. Um, <laughs> some of these pictures are embarrassing. Uh, this is actually me here, uh, graduating uh, from Skyline High School. As you can see, uh, my hairstyle has evolved. I didn't show you the picture of me with a big afro. I guess afros, sorry, they came around, they're in style again. But uh, this is me graduating in 1991. When I was a senior in high school, um, I actually took a physics class. Um, and I wasn't an was excellent student, I would say I was average. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I was a really great student, but I, I had a really rocky career in terms of uh, my schooling. I was in gate programs and moved around a lot, and um, some schools were easier than others. And uh, in my parents splitting up and moving around, I actually uh, kind of had a hard time adjusting to uh, you know, the, different, the different environments. So uh, I graduated, my GPA I think was like a 2.7. Uh, that was my high school GPA, it wasn't great. Um, I ended up applying to San Jose State. It wasn't that far from my parents' house and it wasn't that close to my parents' house. So I said, great, I got in. So I went to a state school. I ended up being uh, the first male in my family uh, to graduate college, which I'm really proud of. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, my aunt, actually my aunt uh, ended up, uh, she had, before I graduated, she did get a PhD um, from Stanford uh, in psychology. And my sister actually got her, uh, she's a doctor now, she's an OBGYN. She grew, I, I grew up, when we grew up, I was playing video games and she was watching live births. So I kind of snuck out of the room and went and played my video games. But she's an OBGYN right now. She actually went to a historically black college university, Hampton University in Virginia and went to, uh, she went to Boston University. Uh, my brother's a network engineer. I could go on and on and on, but this generation has been really, really different in terms of my family and in terms of what my parents stressed to us that was important. And one of those things was college. This is a picture of me and some of my fraternity brothers at San Jose State. Uh, I believe this was 1994. You can see I have a fanny pack right here. Uh, wow, I was much skinnier then. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I had a lot, I, I was pretty bald too, I didn't have any facial hair, uh, but yeah, that was, that was a really good time. That was actually right after the Rodney King incident happened, I don't know if any of you are aware of that, but it's very similar to what's happening right now. Um, in 1991, basically an African American was pulled over and uh, beat by the police, and at that time they had camcorders and they caught it on video and it was all over the news, and there were riots and all kinds of things happening, so this was right after that happened. And I remember I actually had a similar incident happen to me um, in Oakland, uh, right around the same time, right before Rodney King came out. So those were things that kind of, uh, I guess, stained my, my view of uh, who I am and what I can do. This is another picture. Uh, I believe this is at a basketball game at San Jose State, just, you know, my fraternity brothers. I really kind of found uh, a lot of camaraderie and a lot of brotherhood in this fraternity and uh, it was a great place kind of for me to find myself and find a kind of a, kind of my tribe, I guess. Has anyone here seen, uh, uh, seen the recent uh, Black Panther movie? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it talks about, you know, being one tribe, right, finding your tribe. So this was my tribe, this was, these are my guys. I still keep in touch with them to this day. I've uh, been through a lot together. Um, at San Jose State, I did study physics. Uh, after I took that physics class as a senior uh, at Skyline, I actually aced that class. I had a really hard time with chemistry. I got a D in chemistry. I got an A in physics. And I got, I think, a B plus in pre-calculus. So I'm like, hmm, maybe there's something to this physics stuff. So I said, you know, I'm really curious about how things work and why things happen the way that they do. I was curious about the universe. So I decided to major in physics. I started in 1991. I graduated in 2001. So it took me 10 years from the time I started at San Jose State to the time I finished. Now lots of things happened in there and some of those I'm gonna talk about. Um, but yeah, it took me about 10 years to kind of get through, uh, to get through that time. I actually did end up going to a couple community colleges um, to, to get units and to make up units. Um, this is actually a picture from Santa Cruz. Uh, like I said, I'm into music. I'm a singer, I'm a vocalist and arranger. Um, this is some friends that I uh, sing with, well, actually one of them that I sing with. 
this is after a, a performance at your church. Um, as you can see, I look very young, uh, very stress-free, look like I've been sleeping. <laughs> I'm uh, a little bit older now. Uh, this is my wife, Julie. Uh, so we met in about 94, and then we ended up dating in Santa Cruz in 2000 and 2002, we got married. I better get this right. 2003, we got married, um, and we've been married now 14 years. Um, this is our family. So this is Julie. This is me, of course. This is my son, Allende. Uh, Allende is my middle name. Uh, so he actually got my middle name. I didn't want him to be a junior, but I want him to understand his heritage and his African history, so I did pass that, uh, that name down to him. This is my daughter, Kai. She is now 13, uh, she's born on 13, and he just turned 11. So she really loves to, love to write, and he really loves art. Now they both love music, of course. Our, music, our family's a musical family. I'm still trying to kind of get him into STEM. So some highlights from my past career. So I kind of divide up my career, my life, in terms of my career into stages, because I've kind of had a first act, in a second act and a third act. And I'll kind of explain what that means. So my first act, that was when I, did, I thought I wanted to be a research physicist. I'm like, man, I really love physics. I really love this subject. And I actually ended up uh, as a sophomore, uh, my second year at San Jose State, one of my professors approached me and said, hey, you know, uh, we're doing this research project. And it was on uh, examining the ozone layer. So what we were doing is, we were shooting, we were uh, examining how light goes through the atmosphere, how it bounces off of molecules into an O2. They're very small molecules. And the way that those light, the way that the light bounces off of those molecules actually uh, allows us to measure the composition of the atmosphere over time and how it's changing. So at that time, um, I uh, was, uh, did some programming and some uh, data analysis. Under that program, I, I published a report. My uh, my professor actually passed it around, and the director of the physics department got a hold of that report and said, hey, we've got, we've got a position uh, for an undergraduate. They were all graduates and professors and you know, actual physicists that were doing research on, um, on a project uh, under SETI. That's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. That actually does exist. It's a division of NASA, or a division of the government, I guess, that NASA works with. Um, so what we were doing is there, does anyone here know what carbon is? Yeah. Okay. You guys heard of carbon, you know, we're carbon based life forms, right? So um, you probably learned from your chemistry class, your chemistry class that uh, carbon has different isotopes, meaning there are atoms of the same element, but they have different numbers of neutrons, right? Uh, they have different numbers of nucleons. Um, so there are these two isotopes of carbon, they're C12, and C13, meaning one has 12 nucleons, the other one has uh, 13 nucleons. Why am I telling you about this? Well, um, there's a, okay. This is the old way of trying to identify what an element is. So let's say you have a rock or you have a gas sample and you wanna figure out what it's made of. What is this made of? You know, was there any, is there any pieces of this that are organic? The old way was basically to shoot a charged particle, you know, maybe it was iron, maybe it was lithium, maybe it was carbon. You'd shoot it through a magnetic field, and since it was charged, if you shoot a charged particle through a magnetic field, it bends. And based on its mass, right, different things have different atomic masses. Some of, them, some of them are really heavy, some of them are really light, some of them are medium. They bend at different angles, and they hit, they hit a sh uh, like a... a a screen. And where they hit on that screen, you can tell, okay, well, this is carbon, and this is, you know, this this percent carbon, it's this percent iron. So this is the old way of kind of detecting elements. Does that kind of make sense? Now, there's a fancy word for it. It's called mass spectrometry. What we were doing was trying to use a laser because it's lighter weight, um, it's cheaper, and we could send it on a Mars rover. We could make a miniaturized version of this we could put it on the rover, and you're saying, well, why, what does this have to do with search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Well, uh, one of the ways that you can measure whether or not there's ever been organic life is that ratio I talked talk to you about, those, those two isotopes, C12 and C13. 
if you, you, if, you can, if you can measure the ratio of those two isotopes of carbon using laser spectroscopy, then you can tell if there has been any organic life, even like, you know, microbes or, you know, small life, not like, you know, intelligent, you know, walking on two legs, aliens, but just even bacteria. So that's what we were doing. I was in the very early stages on that, uh, of that research project. Uh, I believe about five years after I left that project, uh, the apparatus that we worked on, I think it was finished at Caltech. I was looking on the internet because the internet, you know, was invented after I left there. <laughs> um, and it actually ended up going on a Mars rover, not, not while I was on the team, but afterwards. So that was kind of interesting. I actually figured out that I really didn't want to be a researcher though. I was like, this is really boring. I, this, it's kind of cool, I kind of understand it, but it's really, really boring, it's not for me. So what I decided to do was actually to go into teaching. So I um, actually, uh, right before I graduated, I got involved with this organization at San Jose State and I uh, ended up getting hired on as a, full, uh, uh, as a music director, even though I didn't have a music degree. I minored in music, but I didn't have a music degree. So I sang and I played piano and I actually took classes to learn uh, lots of the different instruments. I took violin lessons, I took uh, some piano lessons, I took, I think, saxophone, clarinet, excuse me, so I took, taught beginning, intermediate, advanced band, I also taught uh, strings, jazz, jazz ensemble, uh, uh, music appreciation, and choir. Um, so I did that for about a year. The middle school students in Monterey just about drove me crazy. Uh, and I, I, at that time, by that time now, I had a degree in physics, and I was planning on, uh, I was planning on, you know, uh, going into physics at some point. And I remember actually, uh, I remember actually going out for a walk one night, and uh, this was right before 9/11 happened. I remember going out for a walk, and I was kind of depressed at the time, and I was like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. You know, I tried the physics thing. I tried, the, you know, I tried all these different things. I tried you know, music, um, I said, so maybe I'll join, maybe I'll join the army. Maybe I'll go into the service, because I looked up and there was a be all you can be sign right there, right? It was right on the road. And I said, I'm gonna join the army. And I woke up the next morning and the towers were on fire. And I'm like, nope, I'm not going into the army, because I'm not actually going into battle. I will scream and faint if I see some blood. So, yeah. <laughs> so I didn't go into the army. Uh, I ended up actually finding a, a position as a physics teacher. So I, uh, I in Salinas, uh, actually was able to teach physics there. That was some of the best years of my life, um, teaching all physics to 9th, uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade students, uh, lots of migrant students, lots of uh, first generation STEM students. Uh, I really, really loved it. It was a very respectful culture. Uh, it was in Eastside Salinas. So lots of people would say, hey, you're teaching in East Side? I'd be like, yeah, I'm teaching in East Side. This is really, really cool. Uh, so I taught there for five years. In that time, uh, actually got married, uh, had kids, and we were really far from our family, so we decided to relocate back to the Bay Area. And so uh, once I relocated back to the Bay Area, I ended up getting three offers from three different schools, um, Gun High School, Castro Valley, and Prospect High School. Uh, I ended up taking the position at Gun High School where I, I taught physics, astronomy, and I actually started uh, an engineering program, a STEM program. So we did robotics, we did electronics, um, I taught uh, computer-aided design and drafting, uh, lots of different things. Uh, a little bit of coding. Um, let me go ahead here. So these are some of my students. Uh, after I left Salinas, I, I promised them, I said, hey, you know, they're ninth graders. I promised them, I said, I want you guys, everyone in here, I want to make sure that you guys graduate and I will come back to your graduation. So four years later, I kept my word and I came back to their graduation. So this is uh, one of my students. I'm not going to say her name for privacy reasons, but uh, this is in, uh, uh, in, in Salinas. Um, these are also another couple of my students uh, from Gunn High School and from San Jose High School. Uh, one of them is actually now at Harvard. Um, she's studying CS at Harvard. Another is at NYU. I believe she's studying international relations. She's very politically active, so I'm very proud of them. 
uh, all of my students that have gone on to do great things. Um, some interesting happened. Some interesting things happened. I would say interesting. Some tough things happened. Right around the time I reached around the ten year, the ten year mark in my teaching career, I was actually diagnosed with anxiety and depression. And the time that I was explaining to you that it took me ten years to finish uh, to finish my uh, undergrad. It started to explain a lot, lots of things, lots of times where I would load up on my classes um, and then halfway through I'd drop half of them because I would just get so overwhelmed that I couldn't, I couldn't handle it and I just thought something was wrong with me. Well, it turns out it, it kind of was, it wasn't, wasn't that anything was wrong with me, but that there was actually something that was treatable that, that I didn't know that I was dealing with. And so uh, being diagnosed with that and now having a family and having kids, I decided I decided to take a step back from teaching um, and kind of refocus and rethink my life and rethink my career. Uh, and you know, teaching it was those very. Uh, I got a lot of joy out of it. Um, I kind of got really burnt out, and I guess this was stage two or phase two of my career, or it's my second act. And it was right before I turned forty, and I said, you know what? You know, a lot of people buy sports cars when they right before they turn forty. I'm going to go. I've been telling all these students that they need to learn how to code. I'm going to go and I'm going to learn how to code. So I uh, put in a resignation, put in my resignation at San Jose High. I was tenured at two different districts. I was tenured in, in Salinas and I was also tenured in Gun, at Gunn in Palo Alto. Um, and then I went to San Jose High to teach. I actually put in my resignation and uh, looked for a college because I was really interested in gaming. Like I remember, like I told you, my sister was watching the birthing videos, TV shows, and I wanted a game. So I said, hey, you know, maybe there's a way that I can combine my music and, you know, my passion for gaming and now my desire to code. So I actually found this college uh, called Cogswell Polytechnical College. I had driven by a whole bunch of times. I had driven by the sign on the freeway. Um, it's, it's in uh, North San Jose. They have a great uh, gaming program and web development program. So I actually signed up for that and had a great time there. I ended up, you know, being making the honor roll a bunch of time, which was very different than my first time around in college. I finished in three years. Um, now being older, now understanding myself better, now understanding, you know, how I learn, um, it really helped. And it was uh, not a shock to me, but it was kind of, uh, um, reinforcement that I made the right decision. So, um, as I was finishing my software engineering degree at Cogswell, um, I actually did a full stack JavaScript boot camp. And this is something that has kind of arisen um, lately, especially the last 10 years. There's been lots of boot camps that have come out. These, these are compressed, what, what I mean by a boot camp, you hear about the military, right? And you before you actually go and Join the military, you go through some kind of boot camp, right? I think if you're enlisted, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know. But um, it's kind of the same deal. You go to through four weeks or ten weeks or fifteen weeks, depending on the boot camp, and you're fully, fully immersed in coding with other people that are doing the same thing. Sometimes it's at a distance. It's online. Sometimes it's actually in person. I actually did an in-person boot camp. So since I already had a CS degree or I was about to receive my CS degree, this was twenty. You see, this is 2014, I believe, or 2015. Um, I decided to do a four-week accelerated JavaScript boot camp because I had been learning on my own. I've been going, and now YouTube's popular, right? So I was going on YouTube, and I was looking at YouTube videos. I found this website called, oh, that's my uh, screensaver. Sorry about that. So I found this website called freecodecamp.org, and I started, uh, teaching myself JavaScript and teaching myself web development. There we go. Um, so yeah, I kind of found a, found a new passion. Uh, so this is my third act, the third act in my life. Um, so just kind of to give you some snapshots, I wanted to give you some snapshots of some different places I worked in, worked at as a coder and then what, what I'm doing now. I want to kind of take some time to focus on the work that I'm doing now. So I did do an internship at PlayStation. The PlayStation that makes the PlayStation, yes, it's that one. Um, 
they have this program called PlayStation University. So they actually go around to colleges and universities around the country and they recruit uh, you know, college students to come and do internships at PlayStation. So I worked there for 12 weeks. I actually relocated to San Diego, which was really tough, you know, being away from my family, but me and my wife talked about it, the kids, we talked about it, prayed about it, and decided that um, you know, it was worth kind of the sacrifice. So uh, I actually was able to do this uh, internship. I worked as a, a web developer, an online developer. I worked on four different games. Um, I, were, I was coding in C Sharp, and I was using the Unity engine. If any of you are into game development or heard of game engines, Unity is a great free engine that you can find lots of tutorials on. Um, so that was a great thing. You know, I got lots of swag and lots of bags and cups. And they were always like handing stuff out. They're like, here, have a, have a cup. You know, here, have a shirt. Here, have a, you know, hoodie. So I got lots of swag from PlayStation and uh, built lots of friendships there. Um, and really had a great time. After moving on from PlayStation, from my internship and graduating with my CS degree and doing my boot camp, I worked at Accenture. I actually worked there as a contractor. So I worked as a full stack JavaScript developer. And what that means is when you see a website, you're looking at what's called the front end. But lots of times you don't see what the back end is, right? Maybe it's running on a server somewhere, right? And if you click a button on the website, it's going to send a request to some server to get some information, right? When it clicks the button, the website doesn't know, it's not smart, it doesn't know what to do when you click that button. So what it does is it asks or it queries the back end or a server. So um, at Accenture, I was a full stack. So I worked on anything from databases, which is how you store, uh, arrange, and retrieve, destroy, create um, data. Uh, to uh, UI, or uh, user interface development, which is basically uh, using things like React uh, or uh, Angular. These are framework, Angular was developed by Google. Uh, React was developed by Facebook. These are tools that they use internally to build, face they, React was used to build Facebook, and Angular was used to build some projects at Google. And then they actually, what they, they did what they call open source, which means they released it to the public and said now, you know, hey, we want to release these to the public. So those were two uh, frameworks. And fr all the framework is, is it takes a whole bunch of code and it bundles it up into an API or an application programming interface. It's just a fancy word for a bunch of code that's already bundled up for you. So it makes it easier for you to build something. So you don't have to build it from scratch. So that's what an API is. So I work with uh, APIs, I work with building websites, I work with data. I did lots of stuff for Accenture. Uh, after Accenture, I moved on to Roblox, uh, Power Imagination, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some of your little brothers or sisters might have played, uh, played on Roblox. Uh, about 60 million monthly active users. Um, everything on there is user generated, so um, it's almost like YouTube for gaming. Right? The users create the content and upload it and share it with their friends, with their family. Uh, we actually hired developers to come into the studio to work on games. Um, they would come from college or, you know, in some, in some cases, high schools. Some, some of these kids were living in trailer parks in, like, Montana. And they made so much money on Roblox that they were able to pay their way to college, buy themselves a car, and they would post it on Twitter. So there's... Uh, lots of earning potential in terms of the ecosystem at Roblox. Uh, great place. Um, after working at Roblox, uh, actually what happened is I got laid off. I actually got laid off. That does happen from time to time. You, you know, layoffs happen in, in the tech world in Silicon Valley. But one of the things that I've learned and the skill that I've picked up is to not let failure define me, what is so-called failure, but to reinvent myself or to um, find kind of the silver lining in, in the situation. And part of that comes from my faith, and part of that comes from the way that I was raised. Um, so when I got laid off from Roblox, um, I started looking for positions, and in about 21 days, I landed a position at this great company, and yes, yay, 23andMe. That's where I am now. So I'm at 23andMe, and so I actually wanted to take some time to, how much time do we have? We got 30 minutes. I got 30 minutes? 
28. Okay, cool. So am I talking too fast? No? Okay, good. All right. I should talk faster. Somebody say faster. <laughs> Somebody wants to go eat. Okay, so 20, I work at 23andMe. And just to kind of give you an overview, our mission at 23andMe is to help people understand, access, and benefit from the human genome. Right? There's about a million base pairs in, the, in every human. Um, you guys have learned, who here knows what DNA is? Okay, so lots of people know what DNA is, right? Uh, our cells, the nucleus of our cell has DNA, and I think the mitochondria also has DNA. I'm not an expert in biology, so if you start asking me a whole bunch of biology questions, I won't be able to answer, and I'm a software engineer. So, but our, uh, so I'm a software engineer at a genetics company. So it's kind of interesting, it's kind of an interesting, um, an interesting intersection of, again, my, my desire to do good in the community, to do good for people, and also still remain technical and creative. Uh, so some of the things that we believe at 23andMe is that everyone has the right to access and understand their personal genetic information. And it's the basis for personalized medicine. Um, when I say personalized medicine, I mean medicine that is informed by your actual genes, by your actual uh, genetic structure, what you've inherited from your mom, your dad, from your ancestors, and what you've developed. Uh, if you actually use DNA data, um, it can actually improve outcomes. There's lots of research on this that it can improve outcomes. We've been able to find markers for lots of diseases. Uh, lots of lots of great things, and it's an active area of research. It's, I think it's the future of where medicine is going. Um, big data uh, will improve your health and accelerate research discovery. So the team that I'm on, which is called the Eureka team, um, one of the things we, we actually deal with is lots and lots and lots of data. So you can imagine having these millions and millions, if not billions of people, I think it's about 60 million people around the world that have submitted their data. Now you have to go through all this data, make sense of it, organize it, figure out which uh, markers on this DNA correspond to which traits and you know run controls and run studies. So there's tons of data, so lots of data. Uh, this is the 23andMe kit. You probably saw our commercial on uh, at the Olympics. We just had a commercial at the Olympics. We just ran a um, commercial also with Warren Buffett, his voice. And so it's like, a, it's like a car commercial. You might be confused if you see the commercial because you're like, this is you know. So, but yeah, it's like a car commercial and it has Warren Buffett's voice and it talks about how you only have one life. Uh, some of the Olympic athletes actually uh, did our test and then they talked about, you know, what it means to them, what their DNA means to them. So, um, it works pretty simply. You order the kit, you spit, you send it in, and then you get a, a web-based or online report. So um, where I come in is along here, lots of data has to be processed. And in order for it to come out in this nice, pretty, e easy to read report, uh, lots of engineering has to be done. So I work on our API. Again, there's that word again, API, right? Remember, it's just a whole bunch of code that's bundled up that just makes building something easier. So our API can consume lots of information, can process it, and then give it out to consumers, can give it out to other companies, um, can give it out to other folks that are trying to use DNA uh, uh, to make advancements. Maybe it's not for medicine, maybe it's for something else. Yes, uh, we are FDA uh, certified. Um, and DTC means direct to consumer, so, um, we are a direct-to-consumer service in, in that we send the kits directly to the consumers. Now, some of you have probably heard of Ancestry.com, right? I know a lot, lots of you have heard of Ancestry.com. Yeah, yeah. So people always say, you know, aren't you guys just like Ancestry.com? What's the difference? Well, Ancestry almost strictly does uh, uh, genet uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, genealogy, right? Your ancestry. That's what they're about. 70% of our business is actually in genetic research and uh, health and traits. The other 30% is um, the ancestry part. So yes, you will get a report that, you can, or you can get a report that you know, talks about your ancestry. 
You can also, uh, if you wish to, you can also get a report that talks about your genetic health risks, uh, your, your carrier status, so like are you a carrier for you know, certain diseases um, or certain things, like do you like salty or sweet, right? Some of them are kind of like light and some of them are like serious, right? Depression, things like that. Um, then 20 plus traits, uh, eight wellness reports, four plus different kinds of ancestry. Um, this is a genetic health risk report. Uh, this is just a sample one. If you do a 23andMe kit, um, you can get uh, a genetic health risk report. So there's lots of data, lots of details. So an engineer has to actually design this user interface, right? The buttons, when you click on the button, what server does it go to? What does the server uh, respond, right? And if you start getting lots of traffic, how are we gonna deal with that? Once we scale up and we start getting lots and lots and lots and lots more customers clicking that button, how are we gonna make sure that our system doesn't break down, right? Lots of those decisions have to be made in terms of the architecture of our software, uh, the integrity of our data, the privacy of our data, making sure that you know, things don't get hacked, right? Uh, this is a trait report. Things like eye color, genetics, um, other factors. This is an ancestry report. Uh, it has your ancestry broken down by, is there a laser pointer on this? Is it the, ah! ah. <laughs> I love laser pointers. I feel like I'm teaching again. Uh, okay, so this is someone's ancestry broken down by, um, by region in the world. Um, and if you're wondering, I actually have not done my spit kit yet. I have it sitting at home. Uh, they give me a free one. They give me two free, actually. Uh, they, gave me, they gave me a free one when I got hired. Um, and my wife actually works at 23andMe as well. She works in legal. Uh, so uh, my wife has done the, the test. My daughter's done the test. Uh, I believe, uh, I think her, her parents have done the test. I have not done the test. So. And I think we're going to get one from my dad. So we're going to be learning a lot about ourselves. I might learn them white. <laughs> that would be interesting. Wait, what? This don't make sense. <laughs> Let me look at that data again. Change a few things. <laughs> that would be really fun. I gotta be careful what I say because I think we're recording this and the CEO's gonna see it and be like, you're fired. <laughs> uh, so yeah, people plus genetics, we can, we can make lots of discoveries. So that's, that's, really, what we're, that's, that's really what we're about. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, <laughs> they're still laughing at the uh, The research, it's opt-in, so uh, in other words, you're not, you're not forced to do it. Um, it's, we are under FDA, we are uh, FDA approved. Um, you can actually cease participation at any time. Uh, some of you are probably wondering, is the government going to get my data, right? Is it going to be given to the military? I think I saw some article like that, right? Data is aggregated and it is actually anonymized. So your, your personal information is separated, like your name and all that stuff. It's separated from the actual data, right? And then it just becomes pure genetic data broken down by lots of different categories, like demographics, right? How many people in Africa are, you know, have this certain marker and, you know, in combination have eaten this certain food. I'm making that up, but, right? So it's not, it's not necessarily about you, your, your name or your identity, but having that data and being able to, again, process it, create it, update it, read it, destroy it, and then also um, uh, share it. To put, the, put that data in the hands of consumers to help you make better healthcare decisions. And that's what we're about. Uh, some of the advantages of doing online research versus, you know, you coming into an office. Participation is really easy. Uh, Geography is not a barrier. Um, we can, you know, we can do this research um, across the globe. Uh, you can have lots of people in multiple studies at multiple times. And you can do lots of cross-pollinization in that way. Um, these are some of the demographics of uh, our, con our consumer base. The average age is 49. 
Uh, it's about 50.6% female. And this is a breakdown in terms of race. We're really trying to get more, you know, more African American, more Latino. So some of you need to sign up for 23 and Me. Cause... <laughs> Say again? No, I have it. I'm saying I just, I've only been working there four weeks. <laughs> I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna spit. See, I'm, now I'm gonna spit when I get home because I'm in the front rows, people just give me a hard time. Okay. Uh, so anyhow, um, some of the uh, significant disease cohorts that we're looking at, Parkinson's, cancer, depression, uh, psoriasis, asthma, cardiovascular disease, that's really, really, really common, actually. Uh, so these are the number of controls. You guys have learned about controls and, and experiments, right? Independent, dependent variables. Okay, good. Just making sure. Okay, so yeah, for each person, uh, there's about 200 studies we can do on average, just for a single person. Yeah, this is kind of just restating what I've already stated already. Um, we make discoveries. We share those discoveries with the consumers, which is our consumer base. And again, it's opt-in. Um, and then we can create educated, um, engaged consumers. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about APIs. Um, this is actually a link to Free Code Camp. Um, and it's an article that talks about what an API is in a little bit more detail. Not super detail, but it's like plain English. Um, so lots of people talk about API that gets thrown around a lot today. I have an API, right? The Facebook API, blah, 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 API. And so it's kind of lost its meaning. Um, so this is a great article that I am linking to. Will they have access? Rance, will they have access to this after? Will they have access? Can I send you a PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, send you some some? Oh, okay. Well, I guess they can just type the URL in. Um, I think I already told you that I'm a full stack software engineer on the Eureka team. Um, in Eureka, you know, it's like people would discover gold and they go, Eureka, right? Because they made a discovery. So it's, the, it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, engineering plus science equals Eureka. So it's like that. Um, yeah, this is, I already said this. Uh, some of the languages I work in, um, I work in Python, I work in JavaScript, uh, I work with multiple development and testing tools. In fact, just right, just before I came here, I was doing a whole bunch of testing and some tests were failing. Basically, when I say testing, you write some code and then you write some tests to verify that the behavior that you want to happen is happening. And then you try to find these different cases, these different edge cases. Well, what if somebody does this? What if something happens this? What if the data looks like this? What if there's no data? What happens, right? And so a whole bunch of tests were failing, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's like 30 tests failing. And so, you know, I'm typing madly, and I'm like, I have to go speak. Uh, so yeah, I do lots of testing, software testing, um, web development. Uh, I'm a full stack developer, so um, I do kind of, I have my hands on lots of, lots of different projects. I can't talk too specifically about what I do because I don't want to violate my NDA agreement. That's a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, but I can kind of generally tell you what I do. Um, oh, this is a good fact. Uh, drugs with human genetic support are about one and a half to two times more likely to succeed. Mm, everybody say, mmm. Yeah, that's, that's, this is true. And here's the, here's the source here in case you, you think I'm giving you fake news. It's not fake news. Okay, so um, I think we have a few minutes left, so I want to leave some time for question and answer. Uh, but just some advice. Uh, don't think of failure, quote unquote failure, a lot of the times. You know, if we get a bad grade or, you know, we don't get into that college we want to go to or, you know, you say, hey, I'm at a junior college or whatever it is. Or I'm this, or I'm a female, or I'm black, or I'm Latino, or Latina. Or, LGBTQ, right? Don't think of uh, those things that society thinks are failures uh, as fatal. Uh, your life can have a second or third or fourth act. 
as you can see from the story that I've told, my life has had a first act, a second act, a third act, even you know getting diagnosed with you know um, a, di a disease that can be pretty crippling. I I've still been able to, to succeed and find my way in the world. So I would say uh, learn to turn failure on its head and find a way to succeed in that. Um, I think uh, kind of in addition to that, I think it's important to kind of find your tribe, to kind of find a community that you can really um, embrace and that embraces you, to have that supportive community when you know you go through the ups and downs in life. I think that's really, really, really important. It helps you bounce back from failure. Uh, there's also more than one way to enter engineering in STEM. There's lots of misconceptions that you have to go to a high-powered school. Nothing against Harvard, nothing against Stanford. They're great universities, but that's not the only way to get into engineering. Like I said, um, I took multiple paths, right? I actually was a teacher. I was a, actually, I was a physicist who liked music, who became a teacher, who left teaching, was trying to find his way, and ended up going and uh, going to Cogswell, a technical college that knew, no one had ever heard about. I ended up getting an internship at PlayStation. Um, and then ended up uh, doing some contract work and ended up at 23andMe, which is an awesome company, by the way. To, we get free food every day, by the way, too. <laughs> like, every day. It's like free food. I walk downstairs and I'm like, oh, today's Asian food. I'm starting to get spoiled because I'm like, man, the Asian food is kind of cold today. <laughs> I'm like, really getting spoiled. I'm starting to get a... Anyways. What I'm saying, I don't know what I was saying. What was that? Oh, there's more than way one, one way to enter STEM, right? You can go to a, a community college, you can go to a two-year college that's got a transfer agreement, right, with another college, get your four-year degree. Some people don't even get their four-year degree. They learn, they learn how to code on their own, you know. Um, so there's lots of ways to enter STEM. There's not just one path. Um, and that's kind of, in my view, the new look of Silicon Valley. Even though the demographics of Silicon Valley have changed, um, and the tech space has changed. Also, the way that you get into tech has also changed. So I consider that the new look of Silicon Valley. If you want to learn how to code, a great place to start, freecodecamp.org. It's really easy to remember. It'll start you like building simple like HTML tags and saying hello world on, the, on a website, right? And it's got all kinds of stuff built into it. Uh, it's really, really uh, a great place to start. This is where I kind of started as I was in school and learning lots of theory, this is where I really got my hands dirty and got the chance to build a lot of, build a lot of stuff and kind of really get familiar with JavaScript and kind of what's, what's hot and what's new. Uh, I don't know if... Um, one of the last things I want to say is definitely find a way to balance uh, your hobbies with your profession. That's one thing that will keep you sane. Um, as an example, uh, when I was in between like my physics classes and my chemistry classes, and math and music classes, I would go to the piano. And I would sit down and I would put some Stevie Wonder on and I would sit down and I would try to figure out uh, how to play the song on the piano. And it was like a different, completely different part of my brain that wasn't trying to solve that physics problem that I had been stressing over. And then I would come back to it and my mind would be fresh. Uh, you know, for some people it's running, for some people it's, you know, lots of other different things. But find, you know, hobbies. Hobbies are important. You know, having, having a well-rounded, um, having a well-rounded life, being a well-rounded person. In the short term, it doesn't seem like it pays off a lot, but your future self well, thank you when you, you know, you have years of being able to have a hobby. I actually still sing a cappella, so um, I uh, sing competitive a cappella. Have, have you seen Pitch Perfect? Okay, so that's the kind of thing that I do. I mean, Pitch Perfect is like, they make it like really, really exaggerated. But I sing bass, um, so I write and I arrange, so I still have kept up my music hobby. And I've played in uh, jazz bands, I've directed choirs, all while still being a software engineer, raising family, and doing all the things, dealing with my emotional health. Uh, so I, what I'm saying is, um, it's really important to be, to make yourself a well-rounded person. Uh, so with that, that's my presentation. Thank you very much.
brought to you by 23 and Me. Oh, yes. Does anyone have any questions or anything like that? Yes. Can you sing something? <laughs> I walk right into that one. Uh, maybe at the end, okay? Okay, maybe at the end. <laughs> Oh, this is the end, I was like, I thought maybe some other people had questions. No one has questions? People are leaving. <laughs> yes? I'd like to contribute to research, but the barrier is a bit high. You got any discounts? Let's talk after. Yes? So, I mean, you mentioned, like, there was a lot of theory when you were pursuing your bachelor's, and then afterwards, that's a really really good what's your name Josh thank you that is an excellent question um, so when I did my bachelor's degree in software engineering it was very general so you, the things that I was learning were really really important not if I wouldn't say everything was like absolutely important but uh, a lot of things, like people that are getting their bachelor's degree, they don't know, really know what to do, so what they do is they make it general. Well, I knew I wanted to be a web developer and a game developer, so the boot camp, I said, I know I want to work with JavaScript, I know I want to work with these frameworks, so it helped me kind of focus and get some hands-on experience with really specific technologies. So that's what the boot camp did for me. Um, I don't think, I didn't, I didn't get that in my, my bachelor's program. Because I knew kind of what I wanted to do, that I wanted to be a software engineer, and I, I knew kind of what I wanted to do, it, it gave me hands-on experience in particular technologies. And that was, the, that was the edge that the boot camp had. And that's why I didn't go to the 15-week boot camp, because they would have started off with like, here's how to program, and I'd fall asleep, because I learned that in college, right? But it was some of the more advanced frameworks that I wanted to uh, get hands-on experience with. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Do you find that, because um, I'm taking my first coding class and it's crazy to me, um, are you still like learning? Like, could you learn forever with coding or Java? Like, yes, I am craft, like, constantly learning. And I, I deal with something called imposter syndrome. And what imposter syndrome is, it's, oh, you guys have covered that? Oh, yeah, so I deal with imposter syndrome. I'll be in my team and one of my other team members will be talking and in my mind I'll be like, it's just like this other voice in my mind It's just like, oh man, he's so smart, man. How are you going to figure that out? Like even today, like I was running into some problems in my code and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to solve this. But I just, I just try different things. I use Google and I go to my coworkers and you are constantly going to be learning. These things are constantly changing. So just get used to that idea of being willing to learn and give yourself permission to, to learn. Yes, I am learning constantly. I mean, I... Uh, I never had a professional job with Python until I was hired at 23andMe. So I'm learning, I'm like, hey, I know how to do web development, but now I'm going to do it in French. <laughs> like, that's how it, that's kind of how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as a software engineer, how versatile do you have to be with different languages? Like, you go to a company, you say, like, I know Google, but they might be coding in, like, C++ or something. Do you have to, like, teach yourself C++ in order to know that company? Well, it, that, that's, that's a tough question to answer because it depends. If you're going to like a game company and they have an engine that's in C++ and they want someone that has this much experience, then yeah, you're gonna have to have that, you're gonna have to have that experience, you're gonna have to gain it. So a good, a, good, a good way to mitigate that is to do internships. Now some other companies, they like let you learn kind of, they want you to have, they want you to be smart. Like Google, they hire really smart people. They, they don't necessarily, um, test you on learning, knowing a certain language particularly, but they'll t test you on data structures and algorithms like the basics of CS. And then as you come in, then you're supposed to, you know, um, you're supposed to grow with the company. So it kind of depends on the company and it kind of depends on the industry that, that you want to work in. Yeah? And also, are all the interview process the same? No. No, 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 no. Now there are some best practices and, um, Actually, I was talking to Rance. I would like to do another talk just on technical interviews because I've actually gone to a technical interviewing boot camp and that's a whole nother skill set, learning how to do technical interviews versus like just a regular interview. They're very different. Um, and interviews aren't all the same. 
they aren't all the same. But there are some commonalities. So, so real quick, my quick, quick question. Sure. So if I were to have her come back for a technical interview workshop, did you have a chance? Yes. I'm not convinced. I'm not going to buy back to copy. Really, if I go back, I would see a show of hands. Who knows what technical interview was? Okay, now I'm convinced, now I'm convinced. We'll work on that. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Ah. All right, so does anybody here know Boys to Men? Yeah. Familiar with Boys to Men? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going gonna... <laughs> to sing that song. I'll sing that song. <laughs> See, they're walking. It's, it's weird singing when people are walking out. <laughs> How do I say goodbye to what we had? The good times that made us laugh always come back. I thought we gave to see tomorrow, but forever is gone away. It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. So we're gonna invite him back. I'm just making a quick confession. You should do that, you know, 23 and me. Cause you know, I found that I'm right too. I'm Australian on my mother's side. So, you know, it ain't changed me now. Well, hey, she, she's gonna invite him. <laughs> <laughs>